Hello, everybody. Good to be with you. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. And today we are going to be taking a look at the metaphysics of national Bolshevism, an article by Alexander Dugan. And so if you just look here on your screen, you see right below the picture of Alexander Dugan is this line, we are enemies of an open society. So you may or may not know, but there was once a famous book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, written by Karl Popper in the 40s. Volume 1, The Spell of Plato. Volume 2, The High Tide of Prophecy, Hegel and Marx. And this book attracted a lot of people's attention, and some of the more thoughtful of them were fierce and ferocious critics of it. Uh, but, you know, before we get to the criticisms, both Dugan's and those of some others, you can see here, whoops, I forgot to take Hegel off the screen. Uh, this is from one of the sales pages for a recent edition of Karl Popper's book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And just uh, look at the characterization and see if anything jumps out at you. One of the most important books of the 20th century, The Open Society and Its Enemies, is an uncompromising defense of liberal democracy and a powerful attack on the intellectual origins of totalitarianism. An immediate sensation when it was first published, Karl Popper's monumental achievement has attained legendary status on both the left and right, tracing the roots of an authoritarian tradition represented by Plato, Marx, and Hegel. Popper argues that the spirit of free critical inquiry that governs scientific investigation should also apply to politics. In a new foreword, George Soros, who was a student of Popper, describes the quote-unquote revelation of first reading the book and how it helped inspire his philanthropic Open Society Foundation. So this is the book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, that both took aim at Plato, as well as Marx and Hegel, as the roots of an authoritarian tradition, and that also was a revelation for George Soros in his establishment of an Open Society Foundation, reflected in the fact that he has written here a uh, new forward to the book. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, here you have a letter by um, Eric Vogelin to the political philosopher or scholar of political philosophy, Leo Strauss. So we're going to look at this letter, which also concerns Popper's book, its merits, and its uh, demerits. But first, let's go back to our main topic here, Alexander Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism, which, you know, just because of this line here, before we even got into the article, forced us to uh, go a little bit deeper into the notion of an open society, where you see it's a phrase used here prominently by Popper, taken over by Soros, aimed at Plato, and this starts to set out the contours of Dugan's position even before we get uh, started. And don't forget, you know, the open society and its enemies. Okay, good to be with you, by the way, those of you who are here, uh, you know, we like to do these streams from time to time. And it's always my pleasure to go over articles like this one with you. So without further delay, <laughs> uh, we are enemies of an open society, you have these sections, seven sections, and we begin from number one, the delayed definition. The term national Bolshevism can mean several quite different things. It emerged practically simultaneously in Russia and Germany to signify some political thinkers' guess about the national character of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, hidden in Orthodox Marxism internationalist phraseology. In the Russian context, national Bolsheviks was a usual name for those communists who tried to secure the integrity of the state and, either consciously or not, continued the great Russian historical mission, uh, the geopolitical policy of Russia's great historical mission. Those Russian national Bolsheviks were both among the whites, Ustralyev, so on, left Eurasians, and among reds, Lenin, Stalin, and so on. In Germany, the analogous phenomenon was associated with extremely left forms of nationalism in the 20s and 30s, in which the ideas of non-Orthodox socialism, the national idea and positive attitude to Soviet Russia were combined. Among German national Bolsheviks, Ernst Nikisch was undoubtedly the most consistent and radical, though some conservative revolutionaries may also be referred to this movement, such as Junger, uh, Ernst von Salomon, uh, and these other figures here, uh, Hans Zera, Harold Schulz and Bazin, Karl Patel, August Winnig. 
communist Laufenberg and Wolfheim, and even some extremely left national socialists such as Strasser and, within a certain period, Joseph Goebbels. In fact, the term national Bolshevism is much more extended and profound. Okay, so first point, it has some historical points of reference, these figures who tried to combine a national element with the uh, communistic element for the most part, but Dugan now says it has a broader significance than that. Okay, to repeat, the term national Bolshevism is much more extended and profound than the listed political trends and ideas. But in order to adequately comprehend it, we should examine the more global theoretical and philosophical problems regarding the definition of right and left, national and social. The word national Bolshevism contains a deliberate paradox. How can two mutually exclusive notions be combined in one and the same name? Right, because the idea is that Bolshevism is internationalism, nationalism obviously is nationalism, so this uh, national Bolshevism movement combines two opposites, as it were, um, two mutually exclusive notions, and it's a deliberate paradox. So how do we make sense of that? Independently of how far the reflections of the historical national Bolsheviks go, which were certainly limited by their surrounding specificity, the idea of an approach to nationalism from the left and to Bolshevism from the right is amazingly fruitful and unexpected, opening absolutely new horizons of comprehension of, logic, of the his, logic of history, social development, and political thought. We should not start from some concrete political facts um, Nikish wrote this, Ustralyev wrote that, or evaluated some phenomenon as such, Savitsky adduced such and such arguments, and so on, but try to look at the phenomenon from an unexpected point of view, which exactly made it possible the national Bolshevism combination uh, itself. Then we will be able not only to describe this phenomenon, but also to comprehend it, and with its help, many other aspects of our paradoxical time. Okay, so that's section number one. If you have any questions about that, you can ask. His whole point here, there were some people who historically used the name, but we're actually going to dive into the concept as opposed, into, as opposed to its history. Uh, it's not a history of national Bolshevism. It's a conceptual articulation of the metaphysics of national Bolshevism. But Dugan moves on from these um, examples of German and Russian uh, exemplars to the more general theoretical problem raised here by Popper, whom we mentioned at the outset. So let's turn to this section two, Karl Popper's inestimable contribution. It's difficult to imagine anything better for the difficult task of defining the essence of national Bolshevism than a reference to the sociological research of Karl Popper, and especially to his fundamental work, The Open Society and Its Enemies, which I showed you earlier. Here it is again. In this bulky work, Popper proposes a rather convincing model according to which all the types of a society are roughly divided into two main kinds, the open society and the non-open society, or the open society and the enemies of the open society. According to Popper, open society is based on the central role of an individual and its basic characteristic features, rationality, step-by-step uh, -step behavior, being discrete, absence of a global teleology in actions, etc., the sense of an open society is that it rejects all the forms of an absolute, which are non-comparable with individuality and its nature. Such a society is quote-unquote open just because of the simple fact that the combinations, that the varieties of, yeah, the possible combinations uh, of individual atoms do not have a limit, as well as no purpose or sense, and theoretically such a society should be aimed at the achievement of an ideal dynamic balance. Popper also considers himself a convinced adherent of the open society. The second type of society is defined by Popper as a hostile, as hostile to open society. Uh, he does not call it closed, foreseeing possible objections, but frequently uses the term totalitarian. However, according to Popper, just based on the acceptance or rejection of an open society concept, all political, social, and philosophical teachings are classified. Okay, in other words, the key division for Popper, open society or not open society, open society or totalitarian, open society or enemy of the open society. The enemies of an open society, Dugan continues, are those who advance, proclaim, put forward variable different theoretical models based on the absolute against the individual and his or her central role. The absolute even being instituted spontaneously and voluntaristically instantly intrudes into the individual sphere sharply changes the process of its evolution, violates or exercises coercion over the individual's atomistic integrity, 
submitting it to some outer individual impulse. The individual is immediately limited by the absolute. Therefore, the people's society loses its quality of exposure or openness and the perspective of free development in all directions. The absolute dictates the aims and tasks, establishes dogmata and norms, violates or coerces an individual as or like a sculptor coerces his material. Okay, so you see Dugan presenting the argument that totalitarianism is wherever you have some sort of absolute notion that limits the realm of individuality. And as soon as you have that, you're in the realm of uh, totalitarianism. You're um, in among the enemies of the open society. Popper starts the genealogy of the enemies of the open society from Plato, whom he regards as a founder of the philosophy of totalitarianism and as a father of obscurantism. Furthermore, he proceeds to Schlegel, Schelling, Hegel, Marx, Spengler, and other modern thinkers. All of them are unified in his classification by one indication, which is the introduction of metaphysics, ethics, sociology, and economy based on principles denying the open society and the individual's central role. Popper is absolutely right on this point. Okay, so Dugan considers Popper to be right in categorizing thinkers on one hand who invoke something metaphysical or absolute or something that limits the unlimited nature of individual freedom, and including ethics and some other factors. They are not members of the open society. They do stand over and against it. The most important point in Popper's analysis, Dugan continues, is the point that thinkers and politicians are put in the category of the enemies of an open society, irrespectively of whether their convictions are right or left, reactionary or progressive. He accentuates some other more substantial, more fundamental criterion, unifying on both poles the ideas and philosophies which at first sight seem to be the most heterogeneous and opposite to each other, Marxists as well as conservatives and fascists, and even some social democrats can be reckoned among the enemies of the open society. At the same time, liberals like Voltaire or reactionary pessimists like Schopenhauer can turn out to be among the friends of the open society. So Popper's formula is either the open society or its enemies. Now we'll turn to section three in a second, but what question in a sense did section two begin to answer? Well, look, what did he say here? You have the um, deliberate contradiction of the idea of national Bolshevism, a deliberate paradox, two mutually exclusive notions. How can you combine nationalism and Bolshevism? And turning to Popper gave us our first hint because the division between the open society and its enemies allows on each side of that equation the meeting of apparent opposites. You see, once again, what does he say at the bottom here? He says that uh, thinkers and politicians are put into the category of enemies of an open society, irrespectively of whether their convictions are right or left, reactionary or progressive. So we're on our way here to Dugan's strict definition of national Bolshevism as among the enemies of the open society, which we'll see in a second. Let me just uh, welcome you to the channel. If you're new here, uh, welcome you back if you've been around. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com, and we're reading Alexander Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism. Section three, the sacred alliance of the objective. The most felicitous and full definition of national Bolshevism will be as follows. I think this is an important passage in Dugan, by the way, especially for those people who know that he's a national Bolshevist or once was, or was involved with the founding of the movement, and so on. So here you have his full definition of national Bolshevism, strictly stated and very helpful. Quote, National Bolshevism is a super-ideology, common to all enemies of the open society, or as it says here, common for all open society enemies, unquote. Not just one of the, ho not just one of the uh, ideologies hostile to the open society, but it is exactly its full, conscious, total, and natural antithesis. The national Bolshevism is a kind of ideology which is built on the full and radical denial of the individual and his central role. Also, the absolute in which name the individual is denied has the most extended and common sense. It could be dared to say that national Bolshevism is for any version of the absolute and for any open society, you see the translation is not great here, okay, but for any open society rejection justification. In other words, national Bolshevism, strictly speaking, means rejection of the open society. To be a national Bolshevist is to be among the enemies of the open society. That's the broadest sense, the broadest meaning of the term national Bolshevism. And because the enemies of the open society include, so to speak, both left and right, 
So therefore, we overcome the problem that the category of national Bolshevism has this apparent deliberate paradox combining that which can't uh, straightforwardly be combined. So we go back here. And then in national Bolshevism, there's an obvious trend to universalize the absolute at any cost, to advance such a kind of ideology and such a kind of philosophical program, which would be the embodiment of all the intellectual forms hostile to the open society, brought to a common denominator and integrated into an indivisible, conceptual, and political block. Of course, Dugan continues, throughout, the history, or throughout history, the different trends which were hostile to the open society were also hostile to each other. Okay, He's not uh, unaware of the fact. Communists in indignantly denied their resemblance to fascists, and conservatives refused to have anything to do with both the above-mentioned trends. Practically, no one from the enemies of the open society admitted their relation to the analogous ideologies, considering such comparisons as pejorative criticism. At the same time, the different versions of the open society itself were developed jointly with one another, being clearly conscious of their ideological and philosophical relation. The individualism principle could have united the English Protestant monarchy with democratic parliamentarian, parliamentarianism of North America, where liberalism was at first nicely combined with slave owning. In other words, the open society, members of the open society recognized the kinship among themselves, but the enemies of the open society didn't. They were fractured and fragmented. The national Bolsheviks were exactly the first to try grouping the different ideologies that were hostile to the open society. They revealed as well, their, as, well as their ideological opponents some common axis, uniting around itself all possible alternatives to individualism and to the society based on individualism. On that profound and scarcely fully realized impulse, the first historical national Bolsheviks based their theories using the double criticism strategy. The aim of that national Bolshevik criticism was the individual, uh, excuse me, yeah, was individualism, both in the rights and in the lefts. In the rights, it was expressed in economics, market theory. In the lefts, it was expressed in political liberalism, legal society, human rights, and so forth. Okay, so national Bolsheviks attacked individualism on the left and on the right. In other words, national Bolsheviks grasped beyond the ideologies, the essence of both the opposite and their own metaphysical position. In philosophical language, individualism is practically identified with subjectivism. If we apply the national Bolshevik strategy on that level, it can be asserted that national Bolshevism is strongly against the subjective and strongly for the objective. Uh, it is not the question materialism or idealism. The question is objective idealism or objective materialism on one side, subjective idealism or subjective materialism on the other. So the philosophical policy of national Bolshevism affirms the natural unity of ideologies which are based on the statement of the central position of the objective, which is conferred the same status as, as the absolute, without dependence on how this objective character or outness um, is interpreted. It could be said that the supreme national Bolshevism metaphysical maxim is the Hinduist formula Atman is Brahman. In Hinduism, Atman is the supreme transcendent human's ego, being regardless of the individual ego. But inside this ego as its most intimate and mysterious part, uh, slipping the imminent grasp. The Atman is the internal spirit, but the objective and supra-individual one. Brahman is the absolute reality embracing the individual from without, the outer objective character elevated to its supreme primary source. The identity of Atman and Brahman in the transcendent unity is the Hinduist metaphysics crown, and what is above all, it is the base for the way of spiritual becoming. This is the point common to all the sacred doctrines without any exception. In all of them, the question is about the main aim of human existence. That is, the self-overcoming, expanding beyond the bounds of the small individual, quote-unquote, ego. The way away from that ego, either outside or inside, brings to the same victorious outcome. Hence follows the traditional initiatic paradox, okay, the initiations of these traditions, expressed in the famous gospel phrase, who ruins his soul in my name, that one saves his soul. The same sense is contained in Nietzsche's genius statement, the human is that which should be overcome, or the human is what should be overcome. The philosophical dualism between the subjective and the objective, affected throughout the history, uh, the more concrete sphere, the ideology, and then the politics and social order, uh, the sp specific politics and social order. 
The varied versions of the individualist philosophy gradually concentrated in the ideological camp of the liberals and liberal democratic policy. This is exactly the open society macro model, which Karl Popper wrote about. The open society, Dugan continues, is the final and most complete fruit of individualism, turned into ideology and then fulfilled in concrete policy. It is appropriate then to raise the problem of the maximum common ideological model for the objective approach adherence of the universal political and social program for the open society enemies. As a result, we will acquire none other than the national Bolshevism ideology. Okay, so the adherence of the open society, they are all about the subject, all about the individual, and anything that stands over and above the individual subject as possibly threatening the freedom or as some sense encroaching on the sphere of freedom of the individual subject is regarded as absolute, totalitarian, evil, fascistic, reactionary, horrible, you know, by now, how all of that works. Uh, no doubt, in part, through the uh, influence of the founder of the Open Society, George Soros, who regarded Popper's book as a revelation. So you're familiar with the Open Society, but what is Dugan telling us? He's telling us that you can find a common ground, a common denominator, a common basis and set of principles for the enemies of the open society. And that gives you the structure of the ideology of national Bolshevism. Together with the radical novelty of that philosophical division, he continues, um, made in this situation vertically toward the usual schemes, such as idealism, materialism, the national Bolsheviks mark the new boundary in politics. Both the left, uh, both those on the left and on the right are themselves divided into two sectors. The utterly left, communist Bolsheviks, all Hegel's successors from the left, are combined in the national Bolshevik synthesis with the utter nationalists, uh, estatists, new Middle Ages idea supporters, in short, with all Hegel's successors from the right. The open society enemies return on their metaphysical ground, common for all of them. Okay, so good to be with you reading Alexander Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism. And we're now on section four, titled The Metaphysics of Bolshevism. Marx, uh, seen from the right. Now we will refer to the clarification of how we should interpret both parts of the term national Bolshevism in an exclusively metaphysical sense. The term Bolshevism has at first appeared, as is well known, during the discussions in the Russian Social Democratic Labor Workers Party as a definition for the fraction, which took the part of Lenin. So Lenin's side. Let us, remind, let us remember that Lenin's policy in Russian social democracy consisted in the unlimited radicalism orientation, uh, refusing compromise, putting an accent on the elite character of the party, and on the theory of revolutionary conspiracy. Later, the people who did the October Revolution and seized power in Russia were called Bolsheviks. Almost immediately after the revolution, the term Bolshevism lost its limited meaning and started to be perceived as a synonym for the majority all national policy, national integration. Bolshevik can approximately be translated from Russian as representative of the majority. At a certain stage, Bolshevism was perceived as purely Russian, as a purely Russian national version of communism and socialism, opposed to the abstract dogmatics of the abstract Marxists, and simultaneously to the conformist tactics of other social democratic trends. Such an interpretation of Bolshevism was, to a large extent, characteristic for Russia and almost exclusively dominated in the West. However, mentioning Bolshevism in combination with the term national Bolshevism is not limited to this historical sense. The question is about a certain policy which is common for all the radical left tendencies of a socialist and communist nature. We may call this policy radical, revolutionary, anti-liberal. The aspect of the left teachings which Popper reckons in the totalitarian ideologies or in the teachings of the enemy of the open society Enemies of the open society is meant here. So Bolshevism, in the term national Bolshevism, Dugan means, Bolshevism is not just the consequence of the Russian mentality influence on a social democratic doctrine. It's a certain component which is constantly present in all the leftist philosophy, which could develop freely and openly only in Russian conditions. Uh, by the way, I apologize. You know, this translation is not mine from time to time. It's uh, clunky, although still good and, and usable. So if I'm stumbling over a phrase, it's just because I'm trying to correct it as I go along in real time. Uh, continuing, in these latter days, the most objective historians more and more often raise the question whether the fascist ideology is really, uh, quote unquote, right. 
And the presence of such a doubt naturally points to an opportunity of interpreting fascism as a more complex phenomenon possessing a great deal of typically left features. As far as we know, the symmetric one, whether communist ideology is really a left one, is not raised yet. But this question is more and more urgent. It's necessary to raise it. And here I'll just interject to let you know, one of Dugan's more recent publications is called Anti-Capitalism from the Right. So it gives you a sense of how he likes to do these experimental um, reinterpretations. It's difficult to deny the authentically left features in communism, such as the appeal to rationality, progress, humanism, egalitarianism, and so on. But alongside with that, it has aspects which unequivocally drop out of the framework of the left and are associated with a sphere of irrational or absurd, mythical, archaic, anti-humanist, and totalitarian um, elements. It is this set of right components in the communist ideology that should be named Bolshevism in the most common sense. Already in Marxism itself, two ingredient parts looked rather doubtful from an authentically left progressivist point of view. It's the heritage of the utopian socialists and Hegelianism. Only Fairbach's ethics, Fairbach's ethics drop out of this Bolshevik, uh, Bolshevism in its essence, Marx's ideological construction, giving to all the discourse a certain terminological coloring of humanism and progressivism. Okay, what he's saying here is that there are features in communist thought that seem like they are right wing. Okay, a myth, the presence of the irrational, of the absurd, of the mythical, of the archaic, of the anti humanist, of the totalitarian. Utopian socialists, which were, which undoubtedly included, excuse me, the utopian socialists, which were undoubtedly included by Marx in a number of his predecessors and teachers, are the representatives of a specific mystical messianism and forerunners of the return of the golden age. Practically all of them were members of esoterical societies, inside which was an atmosphere of radical mysticism, eschatology, and apocalyptic anticipations. This world was a mix of some uh, sectant, occult, and religious motives, the sense of which was reduced to the following scheme. The modern world is hopelessly bad. It has lost its sacred dimension. Religious institutes have degraded and have lost God's blessing, the theme which is common for extreme Protestant sects, Anabaptists, and Russian old believers. The world is ruled by evil, materialism, deception, lies, selfishness, but the initiated ones do know about a soon uh, upcoming new golden age, and promote this upcoming with enigmatic rituals and occult actions. Okay, so utopian socialism has this mystical messianism dimension. The utopian socialists reproduced this common for Western messianist esotericism, this motive common for Western uh, messianist esotericism. They reproduced that on social reality and gave to a coming gold century the so its social and political features. Certainly, there was a point of the eschatological myth rationalization in it, in the utopian socialists. But at the same time, the supernatural character of the coming kingdom is obviously seen in their social programs and manifestos, in, what, in which one could easily detect the mention of a future communist society and its wonders. Navigation on dolphins, operations on the weather, common wives, uh, people flying in the air. Whoops, sorry. Absolutely obvious that this policy has an almost traditional character and such radical eschatological mysticism, the idea of a return to the beginning, makes it absolutely logical to name this not just a right component, but even extremely right. Okay, hopefully you're following the argument here. Dugan is showing, to repeat, the presence of the traditional archaic or quote-unquote right in the messianic mysticism of the socialist, uh, of the utopian socialists. Now, as regards Hegel and his dialectics, it's widely known that the political beliefs of the philosopher himself were extremely reactionary, but that is not the point. If we study Hegel's dialectics more closely, um, to his philosophy base method, and it was the dialectical method that Marx borrowed from Hegel to a great extent, we shall see a concrete, exactly traditionalist and also eschatological doctrine using some specific terminology. Moreover, this methodology reflects a structure of the initiatic esoterical approach to nosiological problems, problems of knowledge, apart from just profane everyday logic of Descartes and Kant, who relied on common sense, uh, nosiological specifications of everyday consciousness, which as we notice apropos all the liberals in Karl Popper are particularly the apolog uh, ap for which they offer apologetics. By the way, there's a book, hey, what just happened? Hold on a second. Uh, huh, strange. Okay, there's a book called Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition, which will give you a very specific account of the relationship between 
Hegel and esotericism, initiation, Rosicrucianism, and so on. You know, reason is the rose on the cross of the present. Okay, give me one second here. We're reading Alexander Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism. This is working. Thank you for being here. Great to be with you. Uh, it's my pleasure, Lyrics of Dust, to be doing this with you. Why this is no longer working, hmm, that I don't know, but I guess I'll sort that out later. Okay, continuing. Hegel's philosophy of history is a tr has the shape of a traditional myth integrated with purely Christian teleology. The absolute idea is alienated from itself and becomes the world. Let's recall the Quranic formula, Allah was a hidden treasure, which has wished to be learned. Being incarnated throughout history, the absolute idea affects people from the outside as a ruse of the world intellect, predetermining the providential character of events. But finally, by means of the Lord's uh, Son Advent, okay, by means of Christ's Advent, the apocalyptic perspective of the absolute idea, the absolute idea's total realization unveils itself on the subjective level, which due to this becomes objective instead of subjective, being an idea become one, Atman coincides with Brahman, and it takes place in a certain chosen kingdom in an empire of the end, which German nationalist Hegel identified with Prussia. The absolute idea is the thesis, its alienation throughout the history is the antithesis, its realization in the eschatological kingdom is the synthesis. So again, this is uh, Dugan mentioning the eschatological structure of Hegel's philosophy. Philosophy of history. Uh, Hegel's nosiology is based on such a vision of ontology, again, as the development of the absolute idea in time. Apart from the usual rationality based on laws of formal logic, operating only with positive statements, limited by actual cause and result relations, Hegel's new logic takes into account the special ontological dimension integrated with potential aspects of a thing inaccessible to everyday consciousness, but actively used, though here he mentions it, actively used by mystical schools of Paracelsus, uh, Jakob Bem, the Hermeticists, and the Rosicrucians. The fact of a subject or statement to which Kantian everyday nosiology, or let's say epistemology, is reduced, is for Hegel just one of three hypostases. I'm going to comment on this in a second, okay? The second hypostasis is the denying of this fact, interpreted not as a pure nothing, as formal logic sees it, but as a special super-intellectual modality of existence of a thing or statement. The first hypostasis is the ding for uns, the thing for us. The second is ding an sich, uh, thing in itself. But apart from Kant's vision, the thing in itself is interpreted not as something transcendent and purely apophatic, not as nosiological non-being, but as the nosiological in another way being. Okay, this is, you don't, you don't have to feel, ah, oh man, if you're getting too lost here, he's doing a quick little exposition of the difference between Hegelian logic and formal logic. Uh, a Hegelian logic that has a sort of mystical character and a formal logic that has a kind of um, mechanical or mechanistic character. I'll continue reading. If you're getting lost in this section, don't worry about it too much. Uh, we can do a separate thing on Hegel another time. Um, thus, if one considers the process of thinking consistently, the synthesis occurs after denying, as the second denying, the denying of denying, or the negation of negation. Uh, in the synthesis, both the statement and the negation are taken. The thing coexists with its own death, which is evaluated in special ontological, in a special ontological and nosiological view. Not as emptiness, but as the being in another way of life, of the soul. The Kantian nosiological pessimism, the root of the liberal meta-ideology, overturns, unveils as thoughtlessness, and the thing in itself becomes a thing for self. Uh, the reason of the world and the world itself are combined in eschatological synthesis, where existence and non-existence are both present without accepting one another. The earthly kingdom of the end ruled by the initiated ones uh, is integrated with the descending New Jerusalem, the end of history, and the end of the Holy Spirit comes. Okay, let me, since this isn't working, guys, give me one second because I would love to, um, I would love to tell you. Oops. Ah, uh, why is that like that? Bah. <laughs> okay, I'll just talk to you like this, okay? So, you could say there's a kind of formal logic where negation has no reality to it it has no separate existence it has no ontological significance it's just this or that and your act of negation separates this from that and you have that kind of uh you know being is on the side of what was asserted and what was denied is just 
out of the realm of consideration, that kind of thing, okay? But in Engel's philosophy, the negative, the act of negation, that the not, okay, that which has been set apart, distinguished, uh, denied to a certain extent, is taken up again in the process of thinking and reflection. So the negative gets included at a higher level of uh, comprehension or reflection. And for Dugan, for the reasons that he mentioned here, this can be expressed in mystical, eschatological, uh, esoteric, and occult-ish terms. And in fact, as you can read in the book Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition, Hegel did himself have some of that in mind and was familiar with those schools of thought as well, which isn't to say that he's reducible to Paracelsus, Bem, the Hermeticists, and the Rosicrucians, but it is to tell you that there's more of a kinship between Hegelian thinking and mysticism than there is, for example, between the um, liberalism of Kant and uh, that whole world. So back to the article. I hope you don't mind that little digression. This eschatological messianic scenario, having been borrowed by Marx, was applied to a slightly different sphere, to the sphere of industrial relations. Interesting. Why did he do so? The usual right, those on the right explain it by a lack of idealism or Marx's uh, rough nature, if not by subversive intentions. So why does Marx have an interest in industrial relations? Because he lacks idealism. This surprisingly foolish explanation, which nevertheless is popular with several, uh, this is a surprisingly foolish explanation, which nevertheless is popular with several generations of reactionaries. What is most likely, Marx, who used to closely study English political economics, was shocked by similarities between the liberal theories of Adam Smith, who saw history as a progressive movement towards the open market society and universalization of a material monetary common denominator, and Hegel's concepts concerning the historical antithesis, the absolute idea's alienation throughout history. Marx has genially identified the maximum absolute self-alienation with capital, the social formation, which actively submitted Europe, uh, contemporary Europe like contemporary to him. In other words, Marx applied, Hegel's, ah, Marx applied Hegel's analysis of the alienation of the absolute idea from itself to the alienation associated with capital and industrial relations. Capitalism, the capitalism structure analysis, its development history, gave Marx the knowledge of alienation mechanics, the alchemical formula of its functioning rules. And this comprehension of the mechanics, the formula of the antithesis, uh, was just the first and necessary condition for the great restoration or the last revolution. For Marx, the kingdom of coming communism was not just progress, but the result of overturning, a revolution in the etymological sense of this word. Not, it's not an accident that he calls the initial stage of the development of humankind cave communism. The thesis is that cave communism Excuse me, the thesis is cave communism, the antithesis is capital, the synthesis is world communism. I guess it's pr 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 primitive communism. The communism is synonymous to the end of history, the era of the Holy Spirit. Materialism and accentuating the economy and industrial relations testify not about Marx's, uh, not about the practical nature of Marx's interests, but about his aspiration to the magical transformation of reality and his radical refusal of the compensatory dreams of those irresponsible dreamers who just aggravate the element of alienation by their inactivity. According to such a logic, the medieval alchemists could be reproached with their materialism and hunger for profit if one does not take into account deeply spiritual and initiatic symbolism of their work, hidden behind their discourses about the urine distillation, obtaining gold, conversion of minerals into metals, etc. Okay, so you guys see the argument. I don't think I need to um, clarify, he's writing exactly about a Gnostic tendency of Marx, okay? Even though Marx seems like materialism, in fact, it's an aspiration to the magical transformation of reality, you see? It's this Gnostic tendency of Marx and his predecessors that was applied by the Russian Bolsheviks, who were raised up in an environment where the enigmatic forces of Russian sects, mysticism, national messianism, secret societies, and the passionate romantic characters of Russian rebels were being summoned against the alienated, temporal, degraded, monarchic regime. Moscow is the third Rome. Russian people is the carrier of God, the nation of the all man. Russia is destined to rescue the world. All these ideas, so I add here parenthetically, right? All these mystical, as it were, ideas, eschatological, messianic, and so on, impregnated Russian life, which had it in common with the esoterical plots incorporated in Marxism. But apart from purely spiritualistic formulas, 
Marxism offered economic, social, and political strategies with clear and concrete, which were clear and concrete even to simple people and giving them a basis for social and political measures. It was just, okay, let me remind you with all this talking and reading, um, what is he talking about here? Why is he going into Marx and the messianic character of Marxist eschatological, mystical, magical optimism? Because he's analyzing the notion of national Bolshevism. He's trying to see how did we bring together these apparently dichotomous concepts? Well, first of all, everything gets included under the broader banner of enemies of the open society. That's step one. And now seeing that national Bolshevism brings together on some common ground the enemies of the open society, he's digging deeper into the Bolshevism side. Then he's going to dig deeper into the nationalism side to see what qualifies them to belong to that category. So what qualifies Bolshevism understood in the sense that he's talking about it here? What qualifies it to belong to the enemies of the open society is that it has this character. It's not mechanistic, materialistic, individualistic, subjectivistic overly rational, um, alienating, and, um, you know, desacralizing. Rather, it has, maybe a surprise to some people, maybe not a surprise to others, it has this mystical, occult, esoteric, eschatological, magical dimension, which makes it completely unlike what you would expect from the adherence of the open society. So that's what he's talking about. That's where we are. And we're about to wrap up the section on Bolshevism to go back uh, to turn rather to the nation. But first, let's finish this. So it was right Marxism, right-wing Marxism, that triumphed in Russia, which obtained the name Bolshevism. So Bolshevism is right-wing Mar Marxism. But that does not mean that only in Russia this was the case. A similar tendency is present in all communist parties and movements all over the world, if certainly they do not degrade to parliamentary social democracy, conforming to the liberal spirit. Thus, it is not surprising that socialist revolutions have taken place except Russia only in the East, in China, Korea, Vietnam, etc. This shows once again that just traditional, non-progressive, and the least modern, um, and correspondingly the most conservative, most right peoples and nations have recognized the mystical, spiritual, Bolshevik essence in communism. Okay, hopefully that's making sense to you. Uh, far from being a universalist, uh, international or transnational movement, Bolshevism has this national dimension present in it, uh, which makes it appealing to right-wing, conservative, um, non-modern peoples and places, according to this presentation. National Bolshevism, okay, let me read. The national Bolshevism takes turn of just such a Bolshevik tradition, the policy of right communism, right-wing communism, which was originated by the ancient initiatic societies and spiritual doctrines in remote ages. So here too, okay, he's linking the term Bolshevism with right-wing communism, with alchemy and those other traditions. Thus, the economic aspect of communism is not diminished, is not denied, but is considered as a gear of the theurgic magic practice, as a particular tool of reality transformation. The only thing that should be rejected here is an inadequate, historically exhausted Marxism discourse, in which the accidental humanist and progressivist themes inherent to the past epoch are often present. The Marxism of the national Bolsheviks means Marx minus Feuerbach, i.e. minus evolutionism, and sometimes and the humanism that sometimes appears inertial. Okay, so that was a long section, but we now have an answer to the question, what does Dugan mean by Bolshevism in this phrase, national Bolshevism? Well, he means that kind of mystical right-wing communism. But now we need to know about the other part of the phrase. And so in section five, Dugan turns our attention there. The other part of the term national Bolshevism, national, also needs to be explained. By the way, uh, normally I would go full screen here to say hi to you, but for some reason it's no longer working, so I'll do it here. Uh, great to be with everybody. My name is Michael Millerman. We're reading Alexander Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism. I do have courses on Dugan at my school, as well as courses on Plato and other enemies of the open society. Millermanschool.com. The other part of the term national Bolshevism also needs to be explained. The notion nation itself is far from being simple. There are its biological, political, cultural, and economic interpretations. Nationalism may mean both racial purity or ethnic homogeneity, accentuating, um, but it can also mean the atomistic individual's consolidation in order to achieve optimum economic conditions in limited social and geographic space. 
Uh, in other words, you know, it can be ethnic nationalism or it can be civic nationalism, and those are two different things. The national Bolshevism national component, historical national Bolshevism as well as meta-historical absolute one, is completely special or, or distinct. Throughout, the, throughout history, national Bolshevik circles were notable for the imperial geopolitical nation interpretation orientation. Okay, so empire and geopolitics. Ustraliev's followers and like-minded people, left Eurasians, not to mention Soviet national Bolsheviks, interpreted nationalism as supra-ethnic, associated with geopolitical messianism, with the place of development. Um, that's a Rus specific Russian phrase. With the culture, with the country continental scale phenomenon. So in other words, he's saying, in national Bolshevism, nation means empire with geopolitical significance and a historical mission. In Nikish and his German supporters' works, we also run into the idea of the continental empire from um, continental empire and the idea of a third imperial figure. In all cases, the question is about geopolitical and cultural, the interpretation of the nation as a geopolitical and cultural nation, free from racism, jingoism, or ethnic purity. Okay, so we're talking about an empire here, not a small nation state, not a narrow nationalism, but a large imperial uh, mission for a people. This cultural and geopolitical nation interpretation was based on the fundamental geopolitical dualism, at first clearly designated in Mackinder's work and then picked up by Aushoffer's school in Germany and by Russian Eurasians. The imperial conglomeration of the Oriental nations united around Russia, a heartland, makes up the possible continental country skeleton consolidated by ideocracy and, plut and rejecting plutocracy, by socialism and the revolution orientation against capitalism and progress. In other words, Dugan's talking here about the geopolitics of land and sea, which he's written about in many places. I translated his book called Last War of the World Island, Geopolitics of Contemporary Russia, under a pseudonym at that time. But uh, the key thing here is that nation has this um, land power significance, not sea power significance. That is uh, significant, he continues, that Nikish used to insist upon saying that in Germany, the Third Reich should have been based on potentially socialist and Protestant Prussia, genetically and culturally associated with Russia and the Slavic world, not on the Western Catholic Bavaria, gravitating toward the Roman and capitalist model. But together with that great continental nationalism, which, by the way, precisely corresponds to the universalistic messianic claims of particular Russian nationalism, which is eschatological and all human, meaning like comprehensive and all embracing. There was also in national Bolshevism a much more narrow interpretation of the nation, not contradicting the imperial one, but defining it more exactly on the lower level. In that case, nation was interpreted in the analogous way to how the concept Narod, people, was interpreted by Russian Narodniks, that is like some organic whole being, in essence, not yielding to any anatomical subdivision, having its own specific fate and unique structure. Okay, let me just explain some of this. Ah. Nation can mean something very narrow. It can mean something technical or legalistic. Like the nation means you belong to it as a citizen. Nation as a juridical concept. Nation can mean something Dugan has been telling us here of a continental imperial sort. So that's above the idea of the legalistic uh, nation state okay you have the, the historical mission of the civilizational um, nation as it were but now he's also giving us the at the lower level but not reducible to just the category of citizenship not reducible to just the legalistic or juridical concept you see so right here where he says that um right here not not yielding to anatomical subdivision having its own specific fate and unique structure so you don't, whoops, sorry. So you don't just construct a people or construct a nation by bringing together atomistic individuals and uniting them under the myth of a common um, identity or by giving them some sort of, as I say, legalistic equality. Rather, it's a, the nation has an essential or an organic component. It's linked and united in some way with, that has its own specific fate and unique structure and doesn't yield to anatomical subdivision. According to traditional doctrine, the certain angel, a celestial being, is appointed to look after each nation of the earth. This angel is given the nation's historical sense, being out of time and space, but constantly present in all the nation's historical uh, experiences. 
The mysticism of a nation is based on this. So every nation has its angel. That shows you how far he is from an idea of a juridical civic nationalism. A nation's angel isn't anything vague or sentimental, um, indistinctly dim. This is an intellectual lighting being, God's thought, as Herder said. Its structure one can see in the nation's historical achievements, in social and religious institutes, which characterize the nation, in the national culture. All gist of the national history is just the text of narration about the quality and form of that lighting national angel. In traditional society, the national angel used to have the personified expression in quote-unquote divine kings, great heroes, pastors, and saints. But as a superhuman reality, this angel itself does not depend on the human bearer. Therefore, after monarchical dynasties fall, it, the angel of the nation, can be incarnated in a collective form, for instance, an order, a class, or even a party. So in this presentation, nation takes as a metaphysical, taken as a metaphysical category, is not identified with the concrete individual's multitude of the same blood, culture, and speaking the same language, but with the mysterious angelic personality showing itself throughout all history. This is the analog of Hegel's absolute idea, but in minuscule form. The national intellect being estranged in the individual's multitude and collected in the nation's elite during certain eschatological historical periods. Okay, so a nation is united by the fact that it has its angel. Here we come to a very important point. These two nation interpretations, the big continental empire one and the smaller nation with the angel, equally acceptable for national Bolshevik ideology, have a common ground, the magic point in which they combine all together. The question is about Russia and its historical mission. This is significant that in German national Bolsh Bolshevism, Russophilia was the foundation stone on which the geopolitical, social, and economic views were based. The Russian and to, greater, to a greater degree Soviet interpretation of the Russian nation was an open mystic community destined to bring the light of salvation and truth to the whole world in the epoch of the end of times where that meets the great continental and historical cultural nations aspects. So on one hand you have, what's he saying here? On one hand you have the view of the Russian people with its specific historical destiny and then also with the empire as it were, with the great continental empire. So the Russian Narod and the Eurasian Empire, as it were, okay, combined in one national Bolshevik vision. Russian and Soviet nationalism just becomes in that situation the national Bolshevist ideology focus, not only within Russia and Eastern Europe, but also on the planetary level. The angel of Russia, Dugan writes, is discovered as the angel of integration, as some special lighting being seeking to teleologically unite other angelic beings inside itself, not obliterating their individuality, but elevating it to universal imperial scales. It is not an accident that Eric Mueller, Ernst Nikisch's disciple and associate, wrote in his book called National Bolshevism, quote, if the First Reich was Catholic and the Second Reich was Protestant, the Third Reich should be Orthodox. Orthodox and Soviet at the same time, Dugan writes. In the given case, we run into the very interesting question. Uh, we run into a very interesting question. Uh, question. For the nation's angels are different individuals, the nation's fates throughout history and correspondingly their social and political and religious institutes reflect the forces disposition scheme in the angelic world itself. It is amazing, but this absolutely theological idea is brilliantly supported by geopolitical research, which demonstrates the interrelation between geographical landscape conditions of nations existence and their culture, psychology, and even social and political preferences. So, it is being gradually explained, the dualism between East and West, dubbed by the ethnic dualism, the land, uh, ideocratic Russia, the Slavic world plus other Eurasian nations, against the island, plutocratic Anglo-Saxon West, the angelic horde of Eurasia against the Atlantic capitalism armies, about the true nature of capitalism's angel, in tradition its name is Mammon, one could easily guess. Okay, so, Dugan, all peoples have their angels. And uh, the West has its ruler, which is Mammon, uh, and so on. Okay, so you get a presentation here of his my mystical, mythical, religious interpretation of the showdown between the sea powers and the land powers in this final paragraph of section five. And just to remind you, I know this is a long and dense article, maybe you weren't expecting it, but we're reading Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism, uh, some references here to Karl Popper to his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, a book that George Soros regarded as a revelation 
and an inspiration for his Open Society Foundations. And we're trying to understand what Dugin means by national Bolshevism, how he interprets the nation and all of that. So he gave us Marx from the right, and now we have Evola from the left coming up in section six. When Karl Popper discloses the enemies of the open society, he constantly uses the word irrationalism. That's logical because the open society itself is based on the norms of common sense and postulates of everyday consciousness. Usually, even the most openly anti-liberal writers tend to justify themselves at that issue and object to the blame in irrationalism. The National Bolsheviks, consistently accepting Popper's scheme, evaluated in the absolutely opposite way, uh, accept this reproach too. I'll explain, I'll comment in a second. That is right, the main incentive of the open society enemies and its most raging and consistent enemies, the National Bolsheviks, is never based on rationalist grounds. The works of traditionalists help us in that most of all, uh, especially Guanon and Evola. So open society is characterized by a commitment to a certain form of limited rationalism. Limited because you remember like in his discussion of Hegel, limited to the structures of formal logic that don't accept the ontological significance of negation, that don't incorporate negation into themselves because they're too worried that that's going to become mystical and absolutist. So on one hand, open society uh, rationalists, and on the other hand, those who embrace to some extent the irrationalism or the mysticism or what have you of their position. Like, for example, Gwen on and Evola. Both Gwen on and Evola expounded the mechanics of a cyclical process in which the degradation of the earth element and corresponding with human consciousness, the desacralization of civilization, and modern rationalism with all its consequences, logical consequences, is regarded as one of the last stages of degradation. The irrational is interpreted by traditionalists not as just negative or um, deteriorative category, but as a vast sphere of reality, not subject to study with just analytical common sense methods. Hence, the traditionalist doctrine in this question does not challenge the witty conclusions of the liberal pauper, but agrees with them, rearranging Marx to directly the opposite. In other words, Popper says, we're rationalists, you're irrationalists. And the traditionalists say, yeah, and that's why you're inferior and we're superior. The tradition is based on supra-intellectual knowledge, on initiatic rituals, provoking gaps of consciousness and doctrines expressed in symbols. The discursive intellect has only an auxiliary character and consequently has not any decisive significance. The center of gravitation of a tradition is in a sphere not only not rational, but also non-human. And the question is not about the insight, guesses, anticipations, and assumptions, but about the reliability of experience of the special initiatic type. The irrational, unveiled by Popper in the center of the enemies of the open society doctrines, actually is not less than the axis of the sacred, the basis of tradition. If it is so, the various anti-liberalist ideologies, left revolutionary ideologies included, should have some relation to capital T tradition. If in case of extremely right and hyper-conservatives, this is obvious. In the case of the left, it's problematic. We already touched that matter when we talked about the concept of Bolshevism, but there is one more point. Revolutionary anti-liberal ideologies, especially communism, anarchism, and revolutionary socialism, assume the radical destruction of not just capitalist relations, but also of traditional institutions, such as monarchy, church, religious cult organizations, and so on. How should we combine this anti-liberal aspect with traditionalism? Okay, you see the question? So at the center of the enemies of the open society is a kind of sacrality, a sacredness. That sacredness is supra-rational. It's easy to see on the right, but it's hard to see on the left, especially when the left attacks traditional organizations and institutions. So how do we think that through, Dugan asks. And here's how he answers. It's significant that Evola himself, and to some extent Gwenon, though it can't be asserted definitely, for his attitude to the left was not so certainly stated as in Evola's case, who openly reckoned himself among radical conservatives and as extremely right. Um, Evola himself denied the revolutionary doctrine's traditional character and considered them as the maximum expression of the spirit of modernity, contemporaneity, degradation, and decay. Okay, so Evola did not see the traditionalist component of the leftist ideologies. However, there were periods in Evola's personal destiny the earliest and latest one, during which he had almost nihilistic, anarchistic views towards surrounding reality, proposing nothing but to quote-unquote ride the tiger, 
i.e. to make common cause with the forces of decline and chaos, in order to overcome the critical point of the decline of the West. But it is not the question of this Evola's historical experience as a political person. What's more important in his writings of even the middle maximum conservative period, the necessity of appeal to some esoteric tradition is accentuated, which is generally speaking not quite, doesn't quite fit the monarchic and clerical modes characteristic for the politically connected Europe, for the European conservatives politically connected with him. It's not just the question of him of uh, Evola's anti-conservative. Uh, excuse me. It's not just the question of Evola's anti-Christianism, but the question of his heightened interest in the tantric, tantric tradition and Buddhism, which, within the frames of the Hinduist traditional conservatism, are considered as quite heterodox and subversive. Besides, Dugan continues, Evola's sympathies to such characters as Giuliano Kremers, Maria Naglovska, and Aleister Crowley, which were undoubtedly thought by Gwenon or considered by Gwenon among the counter-initiation representatives, in the negative, destructive trend of esotericism are absolutely scandalous. So Evola constantly talking about traditionalist orthodoxy and strongly criticizing the subversive doctrines of the left constantly appeals directly to obvious heterodoxy. The fact which is even more significant is that he reckoned himself among those who go to the left-hand path. Here we come up to a specific point associated with the metaphysics of national Bolshevism. The matter is that, or the thing is that, in that trend, not just political antagonists are combined in a paradoxical way, right and left, not just that first sight negating other philosophical systems, idealism and materialism, but also two tendencies in the tradition itself, the positive orthodox one and the negative subversive one. Evola, in the given case, is a very significant writer, though there's a certain discrepancy between his metaphysical doctrines and political convictions, which is based on opinion or some inertial prejudices, characteristic for the extremely right circles of the Middle Europe of that time. Okay, hold on. So if I understood this correctly, and I may not have, um, Evola combines within himself, on the side of tradition, both orthodox and subversive elements of traditionalism. And I guess Dugan is going to use this as a way to look at the Bolshevik side of national Bolshevism to try to give a positive interpretation of its subversive uh, tendencies, something like that. So we got to look a little bit deeper. In his splendid book about tantrism called The Yoga of Power, Evola describes tantric organizations, initiatic structure, and the hierarchy characteristic of them. This hierarchy is vertical also towards sacred hierarchy, a characteristic of Hinduist society. The Tantra, as well as the Buddhist doctrine and participation in its traumatic experience, in some way cancels all usual social and political structures, asserting that one who goes the short way does not need support from the outside. Okay, pause. So you can already see, right? Because we're discussing here, how do we have a traditionalist interpretation of Marxism or Bolshevism, of leftism, if it attacks tr traditional institutions? And here we have evidence from the Tantra, because in some way, participation in the yoga of power cancels the usual social and political structure, asserting that one who goes that way doesn't need to go the long way, the way of the institutions. In the tantric circuit, it is absolutely not important who is a Brahmin and who's a Chandala, the lowest caste representative. Everything depends on success in carrying out the complicated initiatic operations and the transcendent experience, the authority of the transcendent experience. It is kind of a left sacredness, based on persuasion in insufficiency, degeneration, and alienatedness of the usual sacred institutions. Guys, I know, I have a feeling, whoops, sorry, I have a feeling this might be dense for you and difficult to follow, so if you have questions, you could throw them in the chat, and I'm pausing from time to time to explain uh, where we are in Dugan's argument as best as I can. Okay, so here, he has to show the sacred significance of leftist anti-institutionalism, and he's doing so on the example of tantrism. So it's a kind of left sacredness based on these things, okay? The alienatedness, degeneration, and insufficiency of traditional uh, sacred institutions. In other words, left esotericism opposes right esotericism, not because of negation, but because of a special paradoxical statement that insists on the authentic character of the experience and the concrete character of self-transformation. It's obvious that we face this left esotericism reality in the case of Evola, and those mystics who stood at the source of the socialist and communist ideologies. The demolition of churches, 
here's the key point, isn't just a religion negation. It's a special ecstatic form of religious spirit insisting on the absolute concrete character of self-transformation here and now. The phenomenon of old believers' self-immolations or the zeal of the clists belongs to the same category. Gwenon himself in his article called The Fifth Vita, devoted to Tantrism, wrote that in some special cyclic periods, which are very close to the Iron Age and the Kali Yuga, many ancient traditional institutions lose their stamina and therefore the metaphysical self-realization needs in some special non-orthodox ways and methods. Okay, must use some special non-orthodox ways and methods. Therefore, the doctrine of tantrums is called the fifth Vita, despite the fact that there are only four Vitas. In other words, while the traditionalist conservative institutions degrade, like monarchy, the church, social hierarchy, and the case system, special dangerous and risky initiatic practices associated with the left-hand path become the most up-to-date. The traditionalism characteristic for national Bolshevism in the most common sense is certainly the left esotericism, a dubbing in the main the principles of the tantric kuala and the destructive transcendentness doctrine. Okay, in other words, there's the subversive traditionalism. The rationalism and humanism of the individualist kind has smitten even those contemporary world organizations which nominally have a sacred character. The establishment of the troop of tradition in its true proportions is impossible by gradual environment state betterment. In other words, by you know gradual steps. This is the way of right-hand esotericism, beforehand deemed in the eschatological situation. Moreover, the appeal to the evolution and graduality just gives way to liberal expansion. So he's saying left-hand path is the sudden ecstatic state. It's not the gradual uh, evolutionary approach. Therefore, the national Bolshevik comprehension or understanding of Evola consists in accentuating those points which are directly combined with the left-hand doctrines, traumatic spiritual becoming in the concrete revolutionary and transforming experience, beyond conventions and habits which have lost their sacred justification. National Bolsheviks comprehend the irrational, not just as not rational, but as the aggressive and actual destruction of the rational, as fight with everyday consciousness and everyday behavior, as submersion into a new life element, that is the special magic existence of a differential human who has discarded all outer bands and norms. Okay, before we move to uh, section seven, Third Rome, Third Reich, Third International, let me just remind you what we're reading together, if you have just tuned in or if you forgot, because it's been a while. The Metaphysics of National Bolshevism by Alexander Dugan. We started the stream by looking here. We are enemies of an open society, he said. So I showed you that he has reference to this book by Karl Popper, called The Open Society and Its Enemies, with volumes on Plato, Hegel, and Marx. And you see the spell of Plato and the high tide of prophecy, showing you Popper's hostility to such things as uh, magic and, um, and uh, inspiration, mysticism and the absolute and all of that. And so uh, I also tied it in for you to George Soros, who wrote a new foreword for Popper's book recently, which he's called A Revelation and an Inspiration for His Open Society, Foundations, those of you who are interested in how any of this connects maybe to contemporary political matters. And so we're reading Dugan's Metaphysics of National Bolshevism, trying to understand we had his rigorously stated definition, which I can remind you of. Uh, where's that definition? Right here. National Bolshevism is a super ideology common to all enemies of the open society. So it's the full, conscious, total, and natural antithesis of the open society, and therefore he's been setting out for us how that's possible, what it means, walking us through the Nash, excuse me, through the Bolshevik side of the equation, so we can understand in what sense that belongs to the enemies of the open society. And then we just finished the account of the metaphysics of the nation, where you have on one hand the huge continental empire, on the other hand, the nations with their angels. And we also saw Evola from the left in order to see in what sense the left can be anti-institutional. Well, it can be if we follow the left-hand tantric path, which aims at this sudden breakthrough through ecstatic experience and doesn't go the scenic route, as it were, of the institutions. And now we are on section seven. So thank you for being here. I hope you're finding this interesting and are able to follow along. I know I need shorter videos, but there are such good articles to go over with you that... Um, from time to time, I don't mind doing these longer streams, and hopefully you don't mind it either. 
Only two variety only two of the variety of open society enemy doctrines were able to win a temporary victory over liberalism, the Soviet and Chinese communism and middle European fascism. Between them, there were national Bolsheviks as a unique and not realized historical opportunity as a thin streak of clairvoyant politicians forced to act in the periphery of fascists and communists and deemed to see the failure of their integrationist ideological and political efforts. In German National Socialism, um, in German National Socialism, deemed to fail, Bavarian and Catholic Hitler's policy fatally prevailed. So it prevailed even though it was deemed to fail, or do, probably doomed to fail. Uh, well, okay. As to the Soviets, they obstinately rejected the idea to openly proclaim their ideologies underlying mystical reasons, having spiritually exsanguinated and intellectually castrated Bolshevism. Okay, so they deprived Bolshevism of its mystical uh, and spiritual elements. Fascism fell first. Then there was the last anti-liberal citadel's turn, that of the USSR. At first sight in 1991, the last page of the book of the geopolitical confrontation with Mammon, the Atlantic West demon, the perverted cosmopolitical capital's angel, is closed. However, at the same time, not only national Bolshevism's metaphysical truth, but also the absolute historical correctness of its first representatives becomes crystal clear. The only political discourse of the 20s and 30s, which is actual until now, is the texts of Russian Eurasians and German left conservative revolutionaries. Okay, you see, let me just make this point in case you missed it. So who are the relevant authors of the 20s and 30s whose analysis is still relevant now after the collapse of the Soviet Union? The texts of the Russian Eurasianists and of the German left, quote unquote, conservative revolutionaries. Okay, these are the sources that Dugan draws on when he constructs his political theory and when he conducts his political analysis. National Bolshevism is the open society's enemy's last asylum. So again, if you're an enemy of the open society, you have nowhere left to turn but to National Bolshevism as of the time of this article. Unless they want to persist in their outdated, not historically adequate and absolutely ineffective doctrines, by which he means communism and fascism. If the extremely left refuse to be the venal and opportunist social democratic appendage, so they don't just want to go into a parliamentary social democracy, and if the extreme right doesn't want to serve as substance to be recruited as an extremist faction of the liberal system repression apparatus, if people possessed by faith do not find satisfaction in wretched moralist substitutes with which they are regaled by the priests of the willfully misrepresented cults or the primitive new spiritualism. So whether you're on the left, you're on the right, or you're a man of faith, you have only one way, Dugan says in this article, in this little treatise tract, they have only one way, national Bolshevism. Beyond right and left, there's one indivisible revolution in the dialectical triad, Third Rome, Third Reich, Third International. Okay, so not just, as it were, fascism, not just, as it were, socialism, and not just, as it were, uh, religion, but as he puts it here, um, you have only one way if you don't want to get caught up in any one of these ways. The realm of national Bolshevism, the regnum, their empire of the end, this is the perfect accomplishment of the greatest revolution of history, both continental and universal. It is the, it is angels, the return of the angels, the resurrection of the heroes, the hearts uprising against reason's dictatorship. This last revolution is a concern of the acephal, the headless bearer of the cross, sickle and hammer, crowned by the eternal son, uh, Philfot. I guess that's some symbol. Um, <laughs> I wish you can uh, look up if you'd like. So, okay, metaphysics of national Bolshevism. That was a kind of wild article, I think, but an important one. And I searched YouTube uh, before doing this stream and I saw that nobody else had really treated it. Uh, maybe somebody has just without this title, so that's fair, credit where it's due. But it's an important article because, first of all, you get some exposure into how Dugan likes to think here. So he quickly transitions from the historical analysis of the meaning of national Bolshevism to the conceptual analysis, like he often does. And within that conceptual analysis, he likes to make these unusual or surprising distinctions and combinations, Okay. First of all, turning Popper on his head and embracing the category enemies of the open society. 
then working through that contradiction to see exactly what it means. Uh, then working through, you know, looking at Marx from the right in a positive way, not in a critical way. Looking at the traditionalist Evola from the left in a positive way, even though Evola is on the right, obviously, and has a book called Fascism, The View from the Right, which I've covered on this channel before. So by the time you get to the end of all of that, you have a kind of um, programmatic statement here for what it's worth, trying to unite all of the enemies of the open society under the banner of national Bolshevism. Okay, now, since the time he wrote this article, Dugan has moved on to other formulations. And you can consider those other formulations, like the fourth political theory or the Great Reset versus the Great Awakening and so on, in light in part of this article or in relation to or in some continuity with this article to see how his way of thinking through the ideological challenges of the modern and postmodern age uh, preserves a sort of uh, consistency. You know, what are the main ways in which Dugan tries to navigate the end of history, the onset of postmodernity, and, uh, and so on? So some questions about when this was originally written and where it appears. I don't, uh, I don't exactly, it's, I'm pretty sure as well before 2017, okay? I think it's an article from the 90s originally, if I'm not mistaken. You can, I'm sure, search around online and find it pretty easily. It must have been in 2017 that it was added to geopolitico.ru. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is an article from, the, uh, from before the period of the fourth political theory. Fourth political theory develops in 2009. I'm 80% certain that this is an article from the 90s. Yeah, and there's a comment that it seems like national Bolshevism is proto for fourth political theory. In some sense, yes, I think you can see Dugan starting here to work towards a formulation, uh, to work towards a formulation that he later encapsulates in other works. And this idea of Plato as a key source for opposition to the open society is also present in some of the book Political Platonism. We won't go into that now, but it's there. Okay, so. Just a quick uh, quick recap before I end the stream. We've been reading The Metaphysics of National Bolshevism by Alexander Dugan, uh, reading it and commenting on it. In sum, I hope to have given you a sense that he's responding to this book, which was against Plato, against Hegel and Marx, and really a kind of a Bible of a certain form of liberalism. And he's taking this the opposite side to this and trying to find a common ground for the enemies of the open society. And in doing so, articulating the metaphysics both of the meaning of Bolshevism and of nationalism and showing how it is that you can combine, apparently, figures from the right and from the left, uh, apparently such disparate sources, into some sort of more or less coherent platform on which to oppose a popperian liberalism and, as it happens as well, the liberalism of George Soros, who wrote a new forward to the book in a recent publication that calls it a revelation that inspired his thinking. You see, Karl Popper, George Soros, Open Society and Its Enemies. So there you go. I hope that you found that to be interesting. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. I teach Plato, Dugan, other enemies, a thoughtful enemies of the open society, as it were. So I encourage you to go there and, uh, if anything, get the free 30-day introduction to philosophy, which covers some important topics. I don't think you'll regret uh, doing that. Uh, otherwise, take care. Be well. See you in the next stream. Thanks for your time. I hope you found this interesting. Goodbye.